today we are having the first meeting of the community of practice related to the earth observation uh, for water management topic under the digital water program and um, today's topic is understanding the different types and applications of EO data. Next, yeah. So this meeting will be recorded and made available on demand on the IWA website. And uh, after this meeting, you will receive a link with this, you will receive an email with this link and other materials from today's meeting. Also the chat box, you will find it below. And in there, you can um, interact with each other and you can also just, you know, ask general questions. Be sure to use the chat box to share your experiences with us. So, <clears throat> sorry. So IWS work on earth observation for water management is a result of successful partnerships and collaborations. We are a part of the consortium of European of the European project Prime Water, which looks at EO technologies for better water management. In Prime Water, sorry. In in Prime Water, IW is responsible for communication dissemination. <clears throat> sorry, and exploitation of prime water products and end users engagement. Prime water is also represented in the steering group of this community of practice. We also have a memorandum of understanding with Geo Aqua Watch, which aims to enable water professionals to access and share information on the application of EO information and technologies for improved water management. Both IWA and Prime Water are represented in the AquaWatch Steering Committee and Working Group 1, which is focused on outreach and user engagement. Prime Water and AquaWatch also collaborate in promoting their activities within their respective networks. Next slide, please. So today, um, we are going to be hearing from three speakers uh, who will be giving their perspective on um, the topic of today's meeting, which is understanding different types and applications of EO data. Uh, we'll be hearing about next level water quality monitoring, but from Eva, Eva Haas from EOMAP. We'll be hearing about the prime water operational platform from Evangelos Boromas from MVIS. And we'll be hearing about the new URL for satellite-based water monitoring from Christian Totrup of DHA. Following that, we will have a, Q, a question and answer with all of these speakers moderated by Samuel Aguida from IWA. Then we will have some hopefully active and um, interesting, insightful breakout room discussions, which will uh, include all of the attendees today. Then after that, we will have a short summary of the discussion from these breakout rooms. And then we will conclude with um, some closing remarks. So just a bit about this community of practice. Um, the aim, one of the aims is to make sure that we bring together experts who are using earth observation uh, technologies within their day-to-day -day and their research uh, across the water sector. This community of practice is connected to the international to IWS digital water program, which in itself provides a platform for others who are working on digital water to come together and share their experiences and to promote, you know, leadership as well as confidence in the overall digital transformation of the water sector. Next slide. So for this COP, our expected outcomes are just to ensure that the IWA membership and the wider public have an understanding and an awareness of the opportunities available for using earth observation technology in water management, both quality and quantity. Also, it is our hope that IWA is seen as a platform where you can find all of this knowledge and you could also connect with others who are working on these, um, who are working on, on, on similar projects. And finally, we hope that this community of practice will encourage experts, um, both IWM members and non-members, to come together and work together and network and hopefully, you know, share more information and probably, you know, help us to, to work better with EO. And today, 
for our meeting. Our objectives mainly just to discover the types of earth observation, the types and application of earth observation data in water resources, water quality, and urban water management to understand your experiences and challenges as practitioners in using EO products and services and hopefully to discuss possible outputs of this community of practice, what you can contribute to this co community of practice. And now I hand over to my uh, colleague, Samuela, to introduce the speakers. Thank you so much, Erin, and welcome everyone. This is Dr. Samuel Aguida, and I'm the Strategic Programs and Engagement Manager at the um, International Water Association. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Heva Haas. So over the past 15 year, uh, years, Heva has led and managed projects and teams at international institutions such as the European Commission and in the private sector, which allowed her to build international network and bring satellite derived services to the market. Eva is the head of strategic accounts at EOMAP, which is the leading service provider of global satellite derived um, aquatic information. As a head of strategic accounts, she demonstrates the value of maritime and inland water solutions to commercial and um, governmental clients. And uh, she believes that the best reward is to get feedback that the heart observation solutions have increased customers' efficiency, saved costs, and lowered the, um, their project risks. So, um, Iva, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Samuela, for this uh, kind introduction and a warm welcome to everybody who is, uh, has joined. Um, I hope you can see my presentation now. We can. We can, yes. Thank you. Yeah, Samuela introduced uh, my person uh, perfectly. One thing I'd like to mention is, besides that I'm the head of strategic accounts, I'm also very enthusiastic about earth observation. And my aim of today is that within the next 10 minutes, I can share that excitement. And yeah, that you also become enthusiastic about earth observation or even more enthusiastic because uh, having you today in this uh, COP meeting already shows that you have an interest, of course, in that topic. I will tell you more about next level water quality monitoring and uh, start with an introduction about EUMAP because I think it's important uh, to know us. Uh, we are a high tech company for satellite based aquatic information products and services, and we are serving to engineering companies and agencies worldwide since 2006. Me and my colleagues are based in the headquarter in Munich uh, or south of Munich in Germany, but we also have motivated colleagues and offices uh, in Australia, the US, Dubai and Indonesia, as well as a colleague uh, and uh, teams in Brazil. So what are our products and services? We are providing satellite derived bathymetry, water quality monitoring information, shoreline and erosion mapping, as well as seafloor characterization and benthic habitat maps. This is all delivered to you via apps or APIs for a very seamless and online product access, but you can also receive that information uh, online and uh, let's say as a desktop software for mapping and monitoring aquatic environments. Some facts and figures. We are working on more than 100 projects per year, and we've seen in the past year already a 30% growth. That means aquatic earth observation seems to be quite useful for several sectors. And we, of course, hope to see that number is increasing and that we find more enthusiastic earth observation users in the next uh, few weeks, uh, months and years. So we are serving 35 plus countries and we're using more than 20 satellite sensors. I hope you find yourself in one of those fields. These are the application fields of aquatic earth observation. And satellite data is useful for drinking water monitoring, habitat classifications for environmental authorities, algae bloom monitoring. It also helps governmental agencies to understand the water quality of any lakes that they might have uh, to survey, may it be on a yeah, small district level or even country level. 
Satellite data can also be transformed into land water elevation models. And it is very helpful for the hydropower sector when they need to know what, uh, the, uh, let's say, having sediment analytics, that is a yeah, very um, a strong economic cost factor. If you have too much sediment in a reservoir, you should know that in advance and uh, yeah, react timely. Satellites also help in maritime navigation. They support infrastructure mapping and the offshore blue energy, as well as the traditional oil and gas sector. So you see many useful application fields. And I mentioned it before, we are working with more than 20 sensors. I'd just like to name a few. The most important ones for us are definitely the European Sentinels. These are freely available data that is uh, 300 uh, meter resolution daily, that's the Sentinel-3, up to 10 meter resolution with the Sentinel-2, that has a repetition time of five days. And if you want to have more uh, temporarily, uh, temporarily higher uh, coverage and also spatially higher resolution, then we're using commercial um, satellite missions such as World, uh, World View or Planet. I've already mentioned our activity fields. So depending on the application, we are using the fitting sensor to serve and uh, yeah, make a product and, and service uh, tailored to your needs. Today, I'd like to look and dive deeper into the water quality monitoring. Water quality monitoring or earth observation based water quality monitoring provides near real time information on water quality, including a lot of parameters that you can already see here uh, in this uh, yeah, schematic water body. We can look at the turbidity, we can estimate the chlorophyll A, we can detect the surface water temperature and the total suspended matter, as well as the harmful algae blooms amongst other cyanobacteria. The nice thing is, is that we are using a unique physics-based algorithm, and that means it's harmonized over different water bodies globally. That means we can go wherever on the globe and have a look at a water body there and we'll get good results, even uh, if we do not have ground data. Ground, local survey data, ground data is excellent, um, but we would not necessarily need it. And also it's sensor agnostic. That means we can use any type of the sensors that I have just mentioned, uh, also depending on the application. Let me give you a quick journey here to some of the applications worldwide. And uh, I'd like to take you first to New York City, where we work together with Xylem, one of the biggest water company corporates uh, yeah, globally. And uh, we serve the New York City Port Authority here. When you have a look at the graph, you see the orange line. These are observational uh, observations from a, a sample site, so from a ground sensor. And you see that here mainly, uh, let's say, uh, you have, if it, if it goes well, two, maybe three observations per year. So this is the orange line. If you look at the blue line, this is the observation of the same parameter, again, chlorophyll, that can be obtained from satellite data. We have a very high temporal frequency, and you see that very different uh, yeah, time timelines or let's say um, time series are um, available here. So let's have a closer look to this kind of portal. Um, what the customer sees, we have, um, and I already mentioned that, the gridded EO product here, you see the chlorophyll data. This is of 2019, sometime in October. And you see that the whole bay and the area and even the river is covered because satellite data, of course, provides you with a holistic view. In comparison to that, you see the blue dots, and these are the uh, local sample sites. And obviously, they might measure very detailed, but um, with a satellite, we are, yeah, with a very high accuracy, we, are, we have very comparable results, and we can have them at any point that you see in the colored map. We are building so-called virtual stations, and at these virtual stations, we can extract the time series that I have just shown you before, and um, yeah, get much more information out uh, as we can do with traditional means. Let me go to another place also in the US, Lake Elsinore and Canyon Lake in California, where we're looking at the drinking water quality. This is the satellite image. 
And this is the image that shows again the chlorophyll values. We already see that the lake on the left hand side has higher values of chlorophyll and what that means. And if you transform that into an harmful algae bloom indicator, we see that the lake on the left hand side, there is a very likely uh, occurrence of a harmful algae bloom. Um, this can be detected. And you even see where it concent where the concentrations are higher. Such, such information is important for the authorities to act appropriately. And uh, what it means to act appropriately, um, I'm going with you to an example now in Germany to the Mandichu See. This is a bathing water. So fortunately, it's not a drinking water lake, but um, Sadly enough, uh, on the 21st of July, a dog that drank from the water has passed away. And on the next day, there was a bathing water prohibition then issued. If we yeah, look back in time, so if there would have been a satellite-based warning, which at that time was not available, we could have seen this happening because we're using planet data and also the Sentinel uh, data. So we are mixing these uh, or putting these together to a very dense uh, time series. And you really see how the, in this case, cyanobacteria hub event is building up. And uh, yeah, we would have been able with uh, satellite earth observation data to already warn on the 20th of July. So we could have been, um, yeah, maybe saving a dog's life. And this is uh, of course, um, just an example how uh, effectively satellite data is um, uh, in place compared to maybe traditional means, because if the sampling only happens on the 21st or 22nd, yeah, this is unfortunately too late. So continuous monitoring of the water quality is uh, key for, yeah, the, uh, I'm coming to the key features actually with this, because um, yeah, the key features and the cost benefit of the water quality monitoring. Well, we see, and this is important to know, we can look at water bodies with different spatial and optical properties. We can look at marine and inland waters. The products I've already mentioned, but just uh, again to say, we look at chlorophyll A, cyanobacteria, the secchi disc depth, temperature, turbidity, and sedum, but also other parameters. This data is then directly delivered to an online data portal. And um, apart from having the data ready to analyze it, it can also support the ground measurements. So to allocate uh, the, the survey sites uh, in the right way. Besides the, let's say the data and the maps, we are also um, able to provide, of course, monthly reports with the data analytics inside. And uh, the nice thing is this comes uh, customized to your requirements. So you receive reports that fit to your reporting needs. Who are our clients? We are serving federal state environmental agencies, water utilities, and local consultancies. And of course, cost is a factor. And I'd like to mention that um, in terms of analytics and also of the sensor installation, we can state that earth observation is in average uh, 10 times cheaper, more cost effective than the traditional means. Furthermore, the health, security, environmental risk is reduced due to less monitoring campaigns, obviously. And also the boat, uh, the costs uh, for boats and other uh, equipment can be significantly reduced because you can reduce the number of times uh, and of the um, of the surveys. So let me um, have this uh, overview just to to say what is the general benefit of Earth observation for water management. We've already seen the large area overview and. I hope I could show you some examples that this continuous uh, resolution optimization. So we are working from 300 meters currently down to half a meter spatial resolution with uh, some of the commercial data. Then it's combinable with other data. This is also very nice to get a holistic view and it's directly digitized. And very important, most importantly, it's non-disputable. This information is very objective. What do we have in terms of time horizons? We can look back in time for more than 30 years. We are starting our time series at EOMAP from 1984. And in present, we can monitor the current status even in real time and issue alerts, with, which we have seen before is often very crucial. 
And in the future, I think we will also hear from that, we can also support forecasting with satellite data. I've already mentioned it because this is what is next and what is new. Um, we will go to more and more better spatial and also temporal resolutions up to half a meter and several times daily for certain water quality parameters. We're monitoring at different levels, global to local, and we use increasingly artificial intelligence to prove, uh, improve our algorithms and services, especially for the automated quality controls, for example, filtering out cloud shadows or ship detections. The let's say last slide and maybe the most important information for everybody who is hopefully I already convinced but like the last slide that is needed to convince you to use earth observation even more frequently well it will accelerate operation decisions if you're a water utilities operator a water utility manager a regulator or a policy maker we can serve you all with ready to use data you will have better and more cost efficient information compared to the current standard monitoring approaches and yeah with this you can assure supply stability for example if you're managing aquacultures or drinking water reservoirs what is also nice as i said before we can work globally we can visit any place uh, on the globe despite the uh, pandemic situations we can go there and have a look and also nice to mention maybe is that it's a carbon neutral survey method um, yeah, I hope you are excited about Earth observation as well. And if you have further questions, I'm around in this session. And um, yeah, you can also contact my colleagues and me at wecare at eumap.com. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva. And you have definitely convinced me. So <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again. And uh, looking forward to the discussion um, later. Uh, but now we uh, move to uh, the second presentation of today from Evangelos uh, Romas from MBIS. So Evangelos is a researcher in the field of uh, hydraulic and uh, hydroecological modeling. He's the head of uh, the research and development unit at MVIS with significant experience in uh, 3D hydro uh, hydrodynamic and water quality models for, for surface water bodies, process simulation, automated calibration and data assimilation techniques using satellite imagery and in situ monitoring database, uh, data sets, sorry. In a recent EU funded project like SPACO, Prime Water and IFOS, he has contributed to the architectural design of the development of an operational platform for real time forecasting uh, of water quality characteristic in inland and coastal water bodies. So Evangelos has sent, uh, has sent a presentation, uh, a recording of the presentation. So let me see if I'm sharing uh, my sound. Hello, I'm Vangelis Romas from Envis, and I'm going to make a short presentation of Prime Water's operational platform. The platform is available through a web browser, either through the Prime Water's website or directly through the second link. This is the initial page of the platform with the four operational case studies of Prime Water in Europe, United States and Australia. The Prime Water currently offers four services, which are the EO-based monitoring system, the hydrological forecasting service, and the water quality forecasting service, which is offered both by process-based and data-driven models. I will now jump to Melbourne Western Water Treatment Plant, and I will start with the EO monitoring service, which provides operational EO-based water quality products from LATSAT and Sentinel missions. On the map here, we are able to see the latest available satellite image for our case study, which is uh, for uh, today, obtained just a few hours ago. The product shown here is chlorophyll A concentration at a resolution of 10 by 10 square meters. And by clicking on the map, we can read chlorophyll concentration at various points of interest. You may notice a gap here in the center of the map, which, as you can see in the in the true color image is uh, due to the cloud coverage. Apart from chlorophyll A, we are also able to quantify turbidity, total suspended matter, total absorption, taking this depth, and also a harmful algae bloom indicator, which classifies the probability of hub existence based on the presence of phycocyanin pigments. Also, we are able to provide surface water temperature from Landsat 
However, this product is not available in this case study due to the low resolution of Landsat at 30 by 30 square meters and the small size of the ponds, which causes a strong interference with the land boundary. However, surface water temperature is available on all the other case studies. In the calendar here, we can see the dates uh, with uh, available uh, overpasses of satellites and we can go back in time until 2015. Also, there is a useful tool for exploring the temporal vari variation of a parameter in a selected area. For example, in the graph here, we can see the historical turbidity values for the last three years at the selected point of interest. Currently, these EO-based water quality products are produced by EOMAPS processing algorithms. We also aspire to include algorithms from uh, other remote sensing partners of prime water, for example, CSIRO's processing algorithms. And we also aspire to include hyperspectral water quality products from Prisma and DESIS missions, although these products will not be available operationally, but only for historical periods. The next functionality of the platform is the hydrological forecasting service. I will now jump to Lake Hume and select the Hydrology tab. This service is provided by SMHI and the Worldwide Hype Model Setup. In the map we can see Lake Hume and all its upstream hydrological catchments. These two contribute directly in the lake and if I click in, in one of them I can view the hydrological forecast for 10 days ahead regarding river discharges entering the reservoir. In the graph here we can see hintcast and forecasted values of uh, river discharge for today and the following 10 days. Apart from river discharges, the hydrological model provides also forecasts of nutrients, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus and suspended sediments. And those variables are a very important input for the water quality modeling that is performed inside the reservoir. The hydrological model offers both a deterministic and probabilistic short-term forecast. If I switch to the probabilistic forecast, then we still have 10 days forecast, but this time we simulate a hydrological ensemble of 51 individual model trajectories, as you may see in the graph. Okay. So apart from the average ensemble value, we can have an estimation of possible range of values for each day, and we can calculate some useful statistics such as percentiles, which is a valuable input for quantifying and dealing with forecast uncertainty. There is also a third hydrological setup, which is available only in the European case study, which is a seasonal hydrological forecast, where we can have forecasts for up to seven months ahead, averaged on a weekly basis. Moving further down to the modeling chain, we have a reservoir water quality forecasting provided by Envis. This is the Mularja Reservoir in Sardinia, where we have used the Del 3D Suite to set up a three-dimensional hydrodynamic model coupled to an ecological model. The hydrodynamic model is forced with meteorological and hydrological input and provides us the circulation pattern inside the reservoir and water temperature for the next seven days. The map currently displays water temperature for the top layer on a grid of 100 by 100 square meters and 20 vertical layers. By clicking on the map, we can read temperatures at each cell. We can also visualize the water velocities with these nice animated arrow traces. And of course, I can move this time slider up to seven days ahead in the future in six hours intervals. Actually, there is a nice tool that visualizes the evolution of the parameter in the forecasting period. For example, in the graph, we are now observing the diurnal variation of temperature in the topmost layer. As I said, we are using a three-dimensional model, so apart from the top layer, we are also able to get information for any depth we would like. For example, here, in the middle layer of the reservoir, the temperature variation is not so pronounced. Values are almost identical for the forecasting period. The vertical profile of each forecasted parameter can also be viewed in a separate graph for any selected point. For example, here the model indicates that there is a thermal stratification at the selected point of the reservoir. The parameters of the water quality model include chlorophyll A, 
nutrients, phosphorus and uh, nitrogen, suspended sediment and dissolved oxygen. Here I have selected chlorophyll A and the map and the graphs are now showing chlorophyll concentration. And finally, there is a third tool that allows us to view cross-section of any simulated parameter along the two main directions of the reservoir. Both in the hydrodynamic and water quality models, we are incorporating uh, data simulation techniques that are using satellite-based products uh, as well as in-situ measurements to correct uh, the model state and uh, avoid error accumulation. So with the process-based models, we are able to expand the available information that we have for our reservoirs up to seven days ahead in the future. And compared to the Earth observation, we can also have information at deeper layers and information about non-optically active parameters like nutrients. Apart from the process-based models, ENVIS is also employing machine learning models for forecasting chlorophyll and algae bloom events. So I will now move to our last case study, which is Lake Harsa. Data-driven models are trained for specific areas of interest presented as triangles in the map using meteorological forcing forecasted nutrient fluxes from the hydrological model and are compared against EO-based chlorophyll values or even in situ measurements since in Lake Harsa we had some nice historical time series with a large number of chlorophyll values and cyanobacteria cell counts we are currently using three types of machine learning algorithms, Gaussian process regression, random forest, and random undersampling uh, boosting. I will stay in the GPR model, which uh, predicts uh, chlorophyll A concentration only in the surface layer this time. By clicking on a point of interest, we are able to read the chlorophyll values at the current time step. Again, there is a graph that presents the time variation of the forecast parameter. The dashed line are the hint casted values, the continuous line are the chlorophyll values for today and the next 10 days ahead. One nice feature of the machine learning algorithms is that they can provide us with some confidence levels. So for an 80% confidence level, we can see that uh, the predicted values of chlorophyll A concentration increase from 4 micrograms per liter to almost 20 and uh, even higher for the 90% confidence interval. I will now jump to the random undersampling boosting algorithm to present you a different type of product we are using for bloom forecasting. So this algorithm has been trained to predict cyanobacteria cell counts, but uh, not as a scalar quantity, but as a probability of exceedance of a specific threshold specified by WHO. And we have made this choice because we have seen that the model has a stronger skill in predicting if cyanobacteria concentration are going to be over or under the threshold of uh, 100,000 cells per ml, rather than in quantifying exact uh, values of uh, cell densities. So in the graph we can see that uh, the model predicts that uh, for the selected point of interest and uh, the entire forecasting over a horizon of 10 days uh, we're having a no-hub situation with a high confidence level. While if I click to this point then we see that we still have a no-hub situation but this time with a lower model confidence. Thank you so much. Evangelos for that presentation and for showing the um, possibility of the uh, Prime Water Operational Platform. Uh, we now move to the third and final presentation of today, uh, Dr. Um, Christian um, Todrup. Um, Christian is a leading heart observation scientist at the DHI and has close to 20 years of experience in the application geographic information systems, and the geospatial analysis for addressing pertinent environmental and water resources issues. Uh, Christian is currently assisting uh, UNIP uh, with the uh, maintenance of the Freshwater Ecosystem Explorer Geospatial Data Platform and the uh, Data Science for SDG 6.6.1 um, Progress Reporting. He is also the project manager at the um, 
Globe Wetland um, Africa, Wetland Africa project and the World Water um, Surface Water Dynamics, which uh, both have a key focus on mainstreaming health observation in support of water and environmental management and the forward reporting and acting in response to the global water agenda. Um, Christian, over to you and thank you for being here. Thank you very much for this introduction and uh, I'm very pleased to be here. So, um, as mentioned, I am uh, working at the uh, DHI, which is an independent, private and not-for-profit organization uh, based in uh, Copenhagen, Denmark. Our mission is to try and unlock solutions to water challenges by providing access to real-time uh, data and uh, emerging technologies. Relying on almost 50 years of, uh, of research uh, in the field of, uh, of water environment, and we are trying to make it globally accessible through, through our data and software. And uh, this is definitely a nice opportunity to present a little bit about what we are doing in the domain of Earth observation. But maybe first a brief background on, on the water challenge. Uh, we all know that uh, our water resources is affected by climate change, as well as there are increasing demands for water, uh, for food production, energy and water to meet a growing population. Uh, it almost gives itself then that there is a need to, want more, to monitor our water resources, both at national, regional and global levels to understand their changes, their vulnerability, and uh, to provide information for sustainable management decisions. Tragically, you could say uh, then we have seen a steady decline in in situ hydrological monitoring uh, throughout the world uh, and now there's uh, for sure an increasing awareness that earth observation has the potential to, to partly fill uh, this gap i think this uh, was already shown actually by eva uh, uh, a few slides back that uh, what is uh, uh, the reasoning for using earth observation and uh, first and foremost it's a continuous data acquisition so we can monitor the Earth's uh, surface on a regular basis. Uh, it's actually quite nice that it provides access to a historical archive, so you don't need to, to start your monitoring. Um, at time one, you can actually access uh, plus four years of data to look at historical changes. And then maybe of increasingly importance is uh, uh, the multi-scale in terms of very spatial resolution, but also multi-sensor capabilities. So, there's an ever increasing fleet of satellites being launched, which has different uh, capabilities. And by combining um, these different sensors, I mean, we can say uh, a lot about uh, different environmental parameters and processes uh, from both, yeah, come down to local, to, uh, to river basin, to, to global scale. Um, there are so many sensors now that it can be difficult to, to keep track, but there's one important development uh, since uh, the mid, uh, no, since around two, 2015 with the European Copernicus program. And I want to, to highlight this uh, as a specific, uh, you could say, paradigm shift because it's really providing uh, the global community access to, uh, to global data. Uh, on the free and open data policy. And with uh, this, uh, you can see here, a family of satellites, uh, which is providing users with unprecedented uh, capacity to monitor, um, to monitor the earth. And especially, um, yeah, I can say the focus here will be on the, on the three first here, the Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, and Sentinel-3 uh, satellites, and how they can apply, be applied to uh, improve our water resource monitoring. The global aspect and the global data is important because uh, at the heart of, uh, of uh, a number of global agendas, you really find water, whether it's in uh, climate action and Paris Agreement, uh, it's, uh, the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction or the sustainable development uh, agenda, then there's a need to have access to, to water data to support the implementation and monitoring progress on these uh, global agendas. And there's actually already quite a few uh, 
global EO products out there, and uh, many of you may be familiar with the Global Surface Water Extend Explorer, which is a unique uh, benchmark product, you could say, providing access to global data on surface water dynamics uh, for the past um, uh, 35 uh, years. It is, however, uh, also constrained uh, in a number of ways. It's only using one sensor type, uh, the Landsat system, which again is unique in terms of its historical record, but it's actually not, uh, you would say, state of the art in terms of what you can uh, monitor today. Uh, the data is not made available operational, and it's only looking at, at water extent, and, and there's many more uh, options to monitor water resources uh, behind that. Uh, in particular, what we have been working at lately is to, to look beyond that, you would say single sensor approach where you are using uh, uh, optical data alone or, or SAR data alone to, to monitor water resources by combining the two uh, technologies to provide a much more uh, uh, consistent uh, in both uh, uh, time and space. Here, uh, an example from uh, a mapping of mainland uh, China. And uh, of course, it's important to mention also that uh, the new uh, data being made available uh, provide us with, with pentapite of data that needs to be analyzed. So, so a lot of what we can do today is also being facilitated by development on ICT uh, infrastructures, which allow us to, to compute these uh, maps at scale uh, in the cloud. So we can do this at scale, but uh, as you can see on the left figure here, actually providing quite detailed information down to the level of uh, individual water bodies. And maybe uh, to, to further stretch some of the benefits of moving from, uh, from you could say the traditional 30 meter global product to uh, a 10 meter product, which you can, uh, you can get from, from the Sentinel satellites, uh, we can capture many more details. And actually some studies have shown that there's quite a significant part of the global water bodies, which uh, you could say exist uh, within the spatial resolving power of that 30 meter uh, product. So by moving to 10 meter, we are capturing many more water bodies and we can track their changes and uh, they could have quite significant uh, uh, importance or impacts on, on local livelihoods, but also some ecological uh, relevance. So, so this is quite important that we can capture more detail. We can also be more consistent in terms of capturing seasonal changes. And again, relying only on an optical data model, we will uh, in, oh, sorry, uh, in places actually come into situations where there's too many clouds for a specific uh, time period that you would actually have data gaps. And it's trying to illustrate here on this uh, temporal development curve shown in this graph and, and where these red squares show you some months where the Global Surface or Water Explorer has not been able to detect water of any significance, but where the new dual uh, sensor model can actually capture uh, capture data because it integrates uh, SAR data, which uh, you will know is uh, insensitive to to clouds. And then we are also available to to produce this in, in near real time. And in the end, I mean, perfect give you more timely and more accurate area statistics on surface water dynamics. But it's not only about water extent, we can also look at, uh, at water levels from space using a technology known, known as um, radar altimetry. Again, this is not a new technology. It goes back to, I think, the first altimetry missions was up in the, in the 1970s. But um, again, there has been some significant developments, which means we can do uh, much more today than we could uh, do just a few years uh, back. Uh, and, and, in, and what has happened is that symmetry technology is special in the sense it's not a, uh, an image, as you know, from a traditional satellite image is being captured at, uh, at points, which in the early missions were spread uh, quite significant up 
significantly apart, up to several hundred uh, kilometers, and why only larger water bodies was captured. But with the new missions, uh, the spacing is becoming uh, much uh, less, and we can capture many more uh, uh, water bodies. And it gives us an opportunity to look at, for example, changes in, uh, uh, in, in reservoir water levels. And if we combine it actually with the surface water extent mass, we can say something about storage changes in, 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 in reservoir. So we can quantify water by looking at uh, water levels and water extent together. We can also use the altimetry emissions to look at water levels here from a study in the Zambezi River Basin. And you can see here, we have uh, tried to match up the satellite derived water levels with the station based uh, measurement and see we get quite a nice uh, match up to, to, to centimeter, DC centimeter uh, accuracy. And this is, of course, of huge significance in, uh, in, in many of the world's on-gauge on uh, basins. And actually, um, uh, in many cases, I mean, it's not really the water level, but it's rather the discharge, which is the important indicator for, for our users. And in that case, uh, you can inform hydrological, hydro hydraulic models in these on-gate spaces with uh, the satellite altimetry data to produce discharge uh, outputs and, and give you uh, a strong uh, or better monitoring capacity in uh, in, uh, in previously un unmonitored uh, basins. So uh, just trying to, to, to wrap this up, then uh, the ability to observe uh, the dynamics of water resources over time uh, has been significantly improved in recent years, and it's supporting a number of activities from drought mitigation, irrigation management, planning of infrastructure investment. Um, and uh, EO data is, is really plugging in a, a, a gap here, and it, uh, it provides us with, with, uh, with, uh, with these new uh, opportunities to provide uh, timely information for, for making more informed decisions. And uh, as I also mentioned, when we combine this with the advanced and technical infrastructures for big data analysis, um, we can both do this uh, at scale as uh, but it's also now becoming within the VM, VM or within the you know realistic uh, chance of countries to actually adopt the technology and do some of this monitoring themselves and not just rely on open access uh, global data sets. And this is uh, just a final slide here to, to advocate for our Q1. Uh, application project funded by the European Space Agency and where we are actually aiming at trying to empower national and regional stakeholders with uh, not only the data but also the tools so they can independently monitor the water resources and report uh, for the, the national uh, obligations but especially also in response to the global water agenda and thank you where I'm going to stop Thank you. Thank you so much, Christian, for your um, contribution to the discussion. So we now move into uh, um, 10 to 15 minutes um, Q&A. And the, I see um, Eva has already replied to many of the, of the um, questions. Uh, and the, um, so we are actually for this uh, um, Q&A, we are joined by um, Apostolis um, Simas. That, um, uh, Apostolis, if you can please come um, on camera. So Apostolis is the managing director of MVIS, and the, he has deep knowledge of water sector with particular focus on water infrastructure planning, development, and management, working closely with public and private sector water bodies. And currently, he is the co-coordinator of the uh, Prime Water European Project and the IFOS project funded by Innovation uh, Norway. So, Apostolis, I actually start with you, and uh, I have a question um, about uh, which at which spatial resolutions uh, you provide your hydrological and water quality uh, forecast. Right. Um, hello, Samela. Hello. All. Um, all the uh, the spatial resolution that um, we 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 
uh, streamline um, in the platforms uh, that you have um, uh, the demo actually uh, showed. Um, in terms of the hydrological forecasts, um, refer to catchment levels. So, um, well, broadly to give you an indication, global hydrological forecasting uh, services run on approximately 1,000 square kilometers uh, average um, uh, catchment levels. In our showcases at the prime water, uh, we have um, uh, downscale this uh, this information. So the models there and the forecast, the hydrological models and the forecasts run approximately uh, 250 square kilometer um, areas of catchments. In terms of water quality um, forecasting within the lake domain, um, there, of course, this depends also on the size uh, of, 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 of the water body, but um, uh, in the showcases that you have been um, um, uh, that we have demonstrated in the video, um, we're talking about um, spatial resolution of 100 meter, 100 meter, 100 meter cells, and uh, more or less uh, 15 to 20 layers on the vertical, let's say, axis. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And then, um, Eva, I'll go back to you um, with a question about um, how um, to uh, how do you assure that every user gets the right level of information that is directly useful for their respective application? If you can clarify that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Amuela. Yeah, it's important because we are serving such a wide range of users from very technical persons. Um, we've seen also in the chat very detailed questions up to a policymaker that just wants to receive maybe a number on his desk. And um, our answer to that is modular solutions. So we are providing different modules that build on each other. You can, for example, receive the Eolytics suite that means you really have hands on the data, all in a nice interface, of course. So it's already very user friendly, but you can look at the type of sensor data that you like, like the original data. You can dive a bit more into the technical part or you take the EO app and that's like the name already says, it's like an app. Um, you receive here more the, the, the final product um, or even the reports. It can be an app or a portal, what I've shown before. So it's a modular and um, yeah, as a second part, just to, to complete that, um, we also streamline our water quality products into three service lines, baseline, monitoring and alert. So within this, all the parameters are actually, um, yeah, can be classified. And these three service lines really serve um, the different kinds of users. Mm -hmm. And Thank we have you. a good customer care. So that's how mm -hmm. we uh, complete the picture. Good, good. Thank you so much. Um, and, and Christian, um, a question for you. Um, is it possible to elaborate on how Earth Observation is currently being used to support the SDGs and the Global Water Agenda? A big, of a, a big question to ask. <laughs> Yeah, I can uh, I can shortcut it a little bit because um, it's uh, especially the sustainable development goals I've been involved in. So so let's focus on on that part of it. But uh, as you may know, it's quite a a huge system and indicator framework that the UN system has built, and it does really require uh, countries to look behind uh, you know traditional statistical data. Um, and especially for the water goal, uh, Earth observation has proved to be, be quite valuable. Um, uh, and, and then the UN system has been through a process where they tried to gather information uh, on indicator 661, which is change on uh, water related ecosystems from the countries again, because the SDGs is really uh, owned by the member countries. So they wanted to collect this data at the country level. But uh, they found out that a lot of countries don't really have that information at hand. So they had to shift strategy and they were then looking towards these global earth observation products and were gathering the information from there, both in terms of the surface water extent, as I showed, at, uh, but also on changes in, um, there was actually a sub indicator on water quality uh, and um, also looking at the changes in mangrove as a particular, um, uh, water related ecosystem. 
Um, and now you would say they have worked at the global level and the next process is actually to hand back, back that ownership of the data to the countries and try to empower countries to do this mapping themselves. So going from the global data to local analysis and local uh, yeah, processing and, and uh, production of these indicators. Thank you, thank you. And uh, I just saw a question in the in the chat from uh, Anthony um, Kilbrid. Um, so uh, maybe I can uh, um, ask this to uh, all of you. So do you see heart observation data for water quality monitoring replacing standard monitoring approaches? Uh, or do you see uh, them complementing each other in a dual approach? Um, I don't know, um, Eva or Apostolis or Christian. I mean, I can start taking that and we have quickly uh, answered already in the chat, but definitely we don't want to replace um, the ground sensors. They have a value, obviously. What we would like to do is to have the best output for the customer or the user. And that means giving him as much information as possible. So we see it as a hybrid approach. We use earth observation in addition to the ground sensor, but we would not uh, necessarily need it. So Earth observation gives you already a holistic picture. And um, yeah, so hybrid. I can only echo that. It's not about replacing, but about working with the data we have and, and take the, the benefits from what the individual data types brings. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Pastelis, any, uh, anything to add? All data have... Um has their own value, uh, they bring their own value. So um, I think here the, uh, the goal uh, or the aim should be to extract the value from all, from all those data streams that are available and um, transform them into the into actionable information. So um, uh, no, no data is um, just to, to abolish. So um, yes, yeah, certainly a hybrid approach here um, is um, what we should look for. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, so we are running a bit out of time, so I have to conclude the um, the Q and A. But I thank you all for your um, contribution and our um, attendees for the questions. So um, we'll now go into the uh, breakout rooms, and let me share my um, screen once again. So um, the breakout rooms will have uh, moderators and a rapporteur. You will be automatically assigned to this, so you don't have to do anything. Uh, but we'll ask you to, um, to please keep your video on during the discussion, so it will be a lively discussion. And the, um, um, I'll ask Erin to put in the chat um, um, a, a link to go to the uh, Google um, Jamboard when you can uh, add your contribution. So uh, Erin, if you can please do that. Um, so how we intend these breakout rooms, you will have two different parts. In the first part, we, we will ask you to share with us your experiences on projects or initiatives that are related to today's topic, which is understanding different types of application of heart observation data. Um, and then we will uh, um, move to um, your contribution. So what do you do you have any suggestion of what you can contribute to the community of practice? Um, how can we further share information and uh, if you want to volunteer for some of these actions? So um, I think I'll stop sharing now and uh, um, uh, please note that I will take a couple of minutes to go into the uh, different uh, breakout rooms, but you should be able to uh, join them all. So um, we'll see you in the uh, breakout rooms. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a nice and interactive discussions. Um, I think uh, um, this uh, um, final part of the meeting is just for us to summarize um, what we discussed during the, um, uh, the, the breakout rooms. So I'll, uh, I'll give the, the, sorry, I'll give the word to Apostolis um, and maybe you can summarize uh, what was discussed in breakout room one. Right, okay. So um, we had a quick, uh, a quick chat. Um, um, I think, I think uh, what is uh, important to mention here, and uh, uh, I believe we can keep that also as uh, part of the mandate for this um, um, community of practice, is um, 
the need of 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 of, of uh, uh, better awareness uh, of of better um, uh, sharing knowledge and education on uh, how to actually exploit these very strong um, technologies about earth observations and related uh, services. So I think this really seems to be. Um, um, a very um, important point and also a nice uh, and strong, let's say, um, topic uh, to consider um, in our in our community of practice and how to achieve that for the goal. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Apostolis. And uh, um, Eva? Yeah, so we had a very small group, a lot of dedicated ladies. Uh, besides Bibi Laura and me, it was uh, Karin Schenk, our head of EUMAP's water quality department, and a special guest, let's say, our participant Adele. And yeah, she told us that she had hands on um, on flood forecasting. She works with data, um, Sentinel and Landsat to do that, but also rainfall data. So um, definitely um, some projects and initiatives that she was involved in. And we heard a bit about opportunities because she was in it, or, or from yeah, Caribbean, um, let's say uh, from, yeah, what is important. We, we talked about some products that uh, could be used there. Um, and um, in terms of the activities that could be done in the COP and about the contribution, I found we had a very nice discussion that went a bit beyond a classical white paper or blog, which we of course touched upon, but it was very uh, important for us to, um, or, or um, yeah, uh, Adele mentioned, and I liked it a lot, it's like technical and social events. So meet and allow people to get hands on. So it's more towards trainings. So it's really concrete uh, sessions that people see the products in action. And um, yeah, maybe also do some joint projects and um, yes, show how products solve specific problems and learn from each other. So I found this was a very nice uh, thing. And yeah, and these days it's not so easy to meet, but times will change. And I think the virtual world also allows us now to gather more people in a room than we would have maybe done before. So yeah, actual training sessions was our outcome. And I'd like to thank again for the nice discussions that we had in our thank, group. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva. And uh, yeah, I, I, I do like the idea of, uh, of, of meeting people, especially after three years <laughs> close at home. <laughs> so um, Christian, over to you. Yes, thank you. Um... Yeah, I think also we had to have good discussions, and I think one one of the key things that uh, like uh, that I took was was uh, the mentioning again. You said there was awareness and training was mentioned by the other the importance of capacity building, uh, which I think we can all agree on. I agree to, but but also uh, my own experience and some of uh, the participants in in the group could also say. I mean, it's very hard. Thing also, and it is good thinking because you need to meet people where they are, and, and and sometimes you know it's a big challenge to to build capacity in an advanced technology and, and finding that right level. So you don't necessarily need a full PhD to 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 work with the data. So so that was an interesting point. And then yeah, moving forward, I think it was a good good um, suggestions that we try to build or the COP is, is would. Uh, you know, engage in trying to build a best practice from a global perspective, not taking a Eurocentric or US-centric approach, but really trying to, 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 to look across and, and find a, a best practice uh, for water quality monitoring, I think was specifically the one highlighted. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, on, uh, on on my side, we too had a, a very um, little group, but I think it, the discussion was very um, interesting. Um, we talked about the, uh, the importance to consider user needs in, in heart observation technology, and, but also, um, and this, uh, then we, co we connected it to the, to the importance of uh, making heart observation uh, products user-friendly, um, so that we built that trust and that confidence and that easiness on the on the products, and the, um, we also talk about the importance of involving uh, policymakers. Um, 
which is something that uh, we are considering, for example, in, uh, in, in prime water. And the, um, on the um, community of practice, uh, we touch upon, of course, uh, white papers and a webinar with the experts that can share their own experience, but also uh, the importance of bringing uh, people together. And uh, we talk about the possibility of having um, a newsletters dedicated to this community of practice so that people know and and can share this information because as we have seen for the meeting this morning and this meeting now we have we have many projects and uh, we need to create a community so there should be a way so that people can talk and interact um, so um, I think um, with that um, we uh, we have concluded a bit the summary of the um, of the breakout rooms and the, I just wanted to um, conclude this meeting by uh, giving you um, uh, an idea of how to um, keep the conversation going on uh, IWA and network projects and I'll put the link in the chat you'll find a page on uh, this community of practice and uh, um, there is the link to uh, Prime Water European Project and Geo Aqua Watch Initiative, which are linked to this community of practice, and the, a bit of information about the steering group of this group of this community of practice, but also how to get involved. If you click on this link here, you will be able to go to a survey, and uh, you can uh, write down uh, your your name and how you can contribute, so that uh, you we will include you in our um, mailing list and our initiative so um do join also i our iwa connect group which is um the platform that we would like to use for this community of practice to share these um experiences um so i think with this uh, we uh, have concluded the meeting i would like to once again to thank all of you for joining our moderators our presenters our rapporteurs uh, and you of course all the participants um, so thank you again and uh, do keep in touch with us and um, Erin do you have anything to um, add? Well nothing besides thank you very much for joining us uh, this was the first time we had a, a community of practice meeting and I think that it went really well so yeah we're looking forward to a lot more in the future.